to order the uh, January 12th, 2022 meeting of the Costa Mesa Sanitary District Citizens Advisory Committee. Let's start with roll call, uh, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam Chair. Committee member Sue Lester. Here. Jeff Arbor. Present, hello. Seth Rayner. Here. Rosemary Chora. Here. Cindy Brenneman. Here. Phil Marsh. Daniel Baum. And Chair Elodie Katz. Present. Thank you. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of a technical difficulty here on this side. No problem. Yes, before we get started, I, I do have a, a special request. If we can move item number four up to the agenda, um, that's regarding the proposed uh, landscape uh, preliminary plans. Uh, we do have a guest speaker, Eric Sterling here. I don't wanna keep him waiting all, all, all evening. So if it's appropriate, we can put this first on the agenda. Certainly, I think that's just fine. I did, Madam Chair, is, are there any public comments we need to attend to first? I did not receive any, Madam Chair. Okay, all right, and I just, I apologize. I meant to mention this on the call to order, but just uh, since we had previously thought this would be hybrid, but now we're back to fully remote, just uh, like to remind everyone to please try to remember to introduce yourself uh, when speaking, just in case anyone's calling in and doesn't have a uh, video. Uh, okay, well, yes. Uh, Scott, are you going to introduce item four then, B4? Yes, I will. Thank you, Chair Kat. Thank you. So uh, the, the Costa Mesa Center, in the beginning of, uh, I said in July of last year, we, we did an RFP process to, to solicit qualified uh, landscape architects to uh, prepare um, designs and construction documents to renovate our, our grounds area at headquarters by basically removing all the existing turf and all, most, and all the trees uh, and replacing them with uh, uh, drought tolerant landscaping and a, a drip irrigation, irrigation system. The, uh, we end up uh, hiring uh, David Falls Design, which is a local firm here in Costa Mesa, which we're happy to do that. And uh, so far, uh, um, David uh, Falls Design, they assigned Eric Sterling, uh, their, their senior um, architect to, to this uh, project. So far, uh, Eric in, has met with uh, staff a couple of times. I uh, also met with city staff on some proposed designs. Uh, and now we are presenting some of the proposed designs to the Citizens Advisory Committee for your comments, suggestions. And then the, I believe the next step, uh, we will uh, take it to the board and then eventually to the Planning Commission. And thus has to go to the Planning Commission for approval. So, so I am gonna turn this over to Eric Sterling. He's gonna uh, describe what, we, what we're proposing so far. And again, it's still preliminary. So it's a good time to hear your suggestions or comments or ideas and we can um, consider implementing those as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to Eric and he's gonna describe uh, what we've got going so far. So Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you, Scott. So my name is Eric Sterling. I'm the senior landscape architect at David Vols Design. So uh, I've been designing landscapes for public works projects for uh, 25 years. Uh, only projects I've ever worked on are uh, Disney theme parks and public works projects. I don't do anything other than that. So um, with the public works projects, we do have a lot of experience with, uh, you know, uh, such as this. This is a turf replacement project. So we are taking that turf and we're removing it in an uh, effort to conserve water. So uh, that's the, uh, the intent of the design. So uh, what we have done is we've uh, provided a design and we're working with the city of Costa Mesa to refine that design and to, uh, um, well, essentially what we're looking at is we're looking at the two streetscapes, Polarino and Red Hill. So we're looking at creating a, a more aesthetic landscape uh, and to save water. So we've met with the uh, staff, um, I, I believe, uh, two or three times now and uh, um, looking at uh, kind of introducing uh, um, uh, more low water. Some There's a few natives on the list and then uh, um, some native ornamentals and then also trying to create something that's a little uh, more interesting but still fits into the streetscape along Red Hill, um, which is a, a high traffic, uh, highly visible area. And then uh, also something that kind of works with a uh, Polarino. Uh, challenges that we have with the site is that 
Costa Mesa is very restrictive uh, when we want to remove existing trees. They, they would like to re review all trees that are being removed. Um, that, that's a challenge and we're working with the city on that because we want to accommodate everyone's needs. Uh, we have uh, two large ficus trees on Polarino that are kind of right in the middle of where we want to do our, our work. Uh, and we have existing eucalyptus trees on Red Hill that are a challenge because they're underneath the power lines. So uh, they get chopped or hat racked in an effort to keep them away from those power lines. So we have situations where we have the wrong tree in the wrong place. And uh, and it sounds so far as a, the, the city is willing to work with us. Uh, and as a part of what we're trying to do with our design is to uh, um, actually add sidewalk improvements. There are no sidewalks on Polarino or on Red Hill that are existing. So uh, we're working with the city and it looks like we have uh, um, a direction and a, and a uh, well, some resolution with a city where we can actually now move forward with our design and, and uh, kind of propose what we would like to do. So the design overall uh, has some areas where we're looking to incorporate inert materials such as you know, rocks, boulders, cobble and gravel. And that's and then kind of like kind of, you know, um, work with what we have on site. Well, we have some, uh, um, we're, we're trying to do minimal grading right now in order to keep costs, uh, you know, uh, well, to, we don't want to spend too much money on, on grading if we don't have to, but uh, we do have some grading that we would need to do because we are cutting in with the sidewalks. And then the way that it is graded right now, we want to make it a, a little softer transition for the landscape that we're trying to do. So, and, and, and that's kind of where the design is at right now. So what we have right now is we have construction drawings that are underway. We have our planting plan essentially is, is about complete and uh, we have not started our irrigation drawings and, um, but we are working to uh, essentially, uh, uh, as a landscape architect, we do the grading plan and we take that grading plan, we turn it over to our civil engineer. So we have not turned it over to our civil engineer. So that's kind of where we're at right now. We're probably about, just over 30% through our construction drawings. So um, we have to go in an order of process. We can't design the irrigation system until the planting plan is complete. Uh, we can't initialize the civil engineer until we essentially understand what our scope is. So we do have this, you know, a, a definitive process that we have to go through. So, and so far, uh, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a really nice uh, um, design uh, with a lot of color. Uh, and, uh, you know, Eric, that, can you, I, don't, can I don't know if, uh, has everyone seen, is that something that they kind of want to go through it, look at the- Yeah, Eric, the, can you please pull up, let's, let's pull up the, um, the, the preliminary designs, maybe talk about the first one that the that staff really liked about the meandering yeah. sidewalks, and then why we couldn't, why the city doesn't like that. And then maybe also share with mm -hmm. the CD some of the plant palettes, uh, what, you know, some of the colors, some of the pictures, what we're, what we're talking about. Definitely. So- yeah, actually, so what we're seeing right here, this is one of the later designs. So you can see there's there, there's a sidewalk on the left on Polarino, and then there's a sidewalk on the south that's on Red Hill there. So what we were trying to accomplish here was to meander the sidewalk somewhat. And then right, it looks like kind of right where the center of the sidewalk is, there's a, a double dashed line. That's actually the uh, right of way. So what we were asking the city was if we could pull the sidewalk beyond the right of way, uh, on this in order to make it a little bit softer and a little bit more of an experience. So, and this would have, this would have been a, a really nice landscape because you'd have a little bit of buffer between the street. Uh, and also it kind of works because the power lines are right there. And then on the Polarino side where there's two large ficus trees are existing in the, both are in the right of way. Um, and they have a very large root zone. They have a lot of surface roots. And what we were hoping to accomplish on, on this arcing is more of a, a graceful arc, which actually does match what's farther up Polarino, but beyond the freeway. Um, there is examples of this. So we were hoping that the city would be accommodating uh, to a design where the sidewalk was outside of the right of way. Uh, however, on this entire design, this, the city would prefer that all sidewalks be located within the right of way since they are maintaining them. So. Uh, this is the design that we really like that we really kind of wanted to we we're really hoping to move forward with this design is was also a little easier for us because there are some utilities that fall into that and those utilities then would require util uh, coordination for the 
uh, if it's like, say, a, a, a lid or a manhole or some kind of grate, uh, if the elevation has to be reset or if uh, um, the utility actually has to move. So, uh, so this design actually would have been better from a coordination standpoint for uh, the utilities, but um, the city was not the city was not wanting this design. Yeah, if I could chime in there, and, and it's a little disappointing because if you go east uh, of the property, um, you know, towards um, the four by freeway and that area, you'll notice there's no sidewalks there. And, and so eventually the city wants to install sidewalks and the concern is that, well, if we go, if we put Morani sidewalks in, that means we're, they're, the city's encroaching on private property and, and they want everything to look uniform. So that means if we went to this, uh, this Morani sidewalk, that means the other properties have to do it. And that means they'll have to get some kind of agreement with uh, the property owners because now they're encroaching private private property, and so it was just in their in their opinion just a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. And so after we said we said okay we won't push it any harder, and so we went to the alternative, which yeah, I'll show you the alternative. And we were also looking on this where the sidewalk on Polarino would be at five feet wide, which is comfortable for walking side by side, and then the uh, sidewalk that's on Polarino or on Red Hill, I believe, was a six feet wide or so. Um, and, and, and what the city actually asked for was all property within the right of way become sidewalk. So essentially they want that whole zone. And I believe it's eight, so it's eight feet wide on both Polarino and on Red Hill. So that's the direction that the city, uh, gave us. So, and then, yeah, this will be the next, uh, so these are actually kind of these, this concept looks like it's concept one and concept two, but it's, this is really more like uh, four and five. So um, this concept is the, uh, that uh, curb adjacent sidewalk. And this, this was what they preferred. So what we try to do in our design, uh, instead of having that meandering uh, uh, walk on Red Hill, we have more of the meandering uh, um, kind of a, a gravel swale or a, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's got rocks, gravel, cobble and boulders in it. So it's more uh, aesthetic. So, um, and, and also because there's no planting in that, that also helps reduce our water use. So it is, it is ornamental. Uh, and then what the city asked on this one here is because uh, they want everything in the right of way essentially paved. So they want the sidewalk there on Red Hill and on Polarino both widened. And then at the, uh, um, the crosswalk, they want us to push back into uh, uh, basically pave all the way to the right of way line, which gets real close to that existing sign. So that existing sign does need to be uh, replaced or, or relocated. And we're looking to replace it. We're not looking to relocate it. So, um, yeah, so this is essentially the I thought we there. agreed to, we were going to relocate that sign and have it face in Polarino. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be on Polarino. So it'll yes. be on the north side of the driveway right so when people are driving on, on Polarino, they'll they'll see the, the the sign it'll be easier for them to see mm -hmm. yes so um yeah and then do you have the uh landscape or oh yeah. the, okay so this is a demolition uh, exhibit this is an exhibit that the city the city asked us to uh, prepare this they want to know exactly how many square feet of landscape was being replaced so um, this is actually something that will help us also for our uh, uh, turf rebate. So, um, but we, it's a, it's a factor of understanding what the, uh, um, the square footage of turf grass is and the square footage of landscape so that we can uh, better estimate uh, what our water savings will be. We do not know what our water savings will be because we have not designed the irrigation system. Uh, once the irrigation system is designed, we'll, we will know exactly what our water savings will be. Uh, but we are going from an overhead spray uh, application to 100% uh, uh, drip irrigation. And uh, so we are going from a, a, a wool calls or, or a water use factor of eight. Uh, we're trying to get that down to between two and three. So we're probably looking at a 60 to maybe 70% reduction for uh, uh, irrigation water use. So that's that's kind of our goal right now. And then this is the original concept package. So this will have, uh, this has the pretty stuff in it. This is uh, the nice, nicely colored uh, plans. That's why it takes so long to load.
Okay. So this is just uh, the uh, original idea. And we there was some comments that we had taken on this, uh, um, uh, essentially to make the design a little bit more interesting and in, uh, uh, how we were actually using the, 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 the inert, the gravel rock and uh, boulders. So um, it kind of took a hybrid of this design is what we actually, uh, is the design that kind of progressed. So uh, we show a, a, a A, a B and a C, and then kind of becomes a hybrid of all of those plus a few other comments. So um, on this one, the C, con this, this design here, you can see there's actually a little bit more of the swale, uh, uh, kind of the arcing back and forth design for the rock cobble and uh, boulders, kind of that swale idea. So this is kind of the, like the landscape kind of came out of this idea. So, and then uh, if you want to move on. So uh, this is just kind of like some character photos. This is what we're trying to go for because we're on Red Hill and it's a very highly visible area. We're looking for a, uh, um, uh, a landscape aesthetic that's consistent with uh, commercial uh, buildings, but something that's also somewhat modern. So uh, speed limit is high on Red Hill. So uh, just like any kind of streetscape, we take that into account. And because it's also corporate or it's a commercial building, we don't want to we don't want to do a, a salad bowl or something that's really kind of more intimate. That's say that you would find someone's like a, a, like a residential design where you have one of each thing. So we are trying to create the idea of masses and layering uh, that's kind of appropriate for whether it's a pedestrian walking, um, but also for a, you know a, a vehicle passing by 40, 45 or, or more, you know, as they do through Red Hill. Uh, and our office is just off of Red Hill too. So we're, we're very familiar with a, with a location. So um, we're two, two uh, um, blocks down. So um, we are looking at some, uh, uh, you know, uh, specific plants and, 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 and that's what we can see here. This is kind of like our, this is more of our, our, our plant palette here. And this, we are using uh, um, um, much of this plant material. I think there's a few things that are on this list that we actually just didn't quite get to, or, and there's, a, there's also a few things that we did actually add that uh, were not on this list. So um, yeah, we are looking, we have, we have uh, um, I don't think we didn't label the water use on this. Sometimes on this uh, sheet we label the water use, but most of our our, our landscape shrubs are are um, medium and and low. So and especially for Costa Mesa, so uh, a lot of nice plant material. Looking for a lot of color, uh, and there's probably a couple plants in here that may get uh, substituted or changed out for something that's a little bit uh, even more uh, uh, more nativey. So and that's something that we'll we can kind of discuss too. So uh, you can see the rock cobble and the uh, gravel all there on the bottom. So uh, the one with that blue thing, that's supposed to be like a, a construction helmet there. So you can see that those, those are actually uh, fairly large in size. So um, we are sourcing all of the, uh, these uh, materials from the same quarry. So um, there are no quarries uh, nearby in Orange County essentially. So um, these all do come from the Coachella Valley area. So yeah. So with that, I guess we can uh, we can take some questions or. Do you, do you want to, Eric? Can you address some of the comments made by uh, Chair Katz earlier? Uh, she wrote some good suggestions and maybe share oh, your thoughts. Yeah. On that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So uh, um, yeah. So I, I believe the first comment was about uh, if we could incorporate more of a, a bioswale concept into the uh, um, the rock areas. Uh, I do not have a geotechnical report for this area specifically, um, but with a broad understanding of Costa Mesa, that is functional. Um, we could do that. It would require additional grading. It would require uh, some soil export. So we're already having to cut into the landscape in order to accommodate the uh, um, sidewalks. Um, those sidewalks are 2%. Uh, whereas the existing landscape immediately does go up, so there would be an additional export. So, um, yeah, um, we can do that. We haven't sent the design off to the civil engineer yet. So, um, and then uh, holistically speaking, for a bioswale, we are allowed to capture the water and hold that water for only 72 hours after that, which time it has to be gone. So, uh, as long as the soil type works, we can do that. Uh, we may want to punch down into the ground a few. Uh, um, uh, say, uh, um, we we'll call it like a, a sump drain or, or some kind of infiltration. So, and that's, that's something that we can do. 
there is also a bioswale planting mix um, that does hold a good amount of water. Uh, we don't necessarily need to use that um, with the plant palette that we have so far. So, um, and it's, it's coast, this, this part of Costa Mesa soils are actually pretty good. So um, there are other areas, I mean, I have a project that's in Buena Park with a, a lot of clay soil and a project in Tustin with a lot of clay soil. So those are not appropriate for infiltration, uh, but this actually would, this would work. And then uh, um, on uh, comment number two was uh, if we could uh, incorporate more natives into it. So um, yes, uh, and then to be, but from my opinion is that we are on Red Hill. This is a highly visible area. So there will be a lot of comment if we have a landscape that is uh, not necessarily green all year, doesn't look good all year. Uh, it's a bit of acquired taste. So um, I would like to incorporate more uh, 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 natives that would be considered more ornamental and longer lasting. I don't want to use plants that aren't going to live uh, um, five years. Sure. So uh, uh, we really like to design for at least you know 10 to 15 years if we can. So, um, and, and there are some good plants that, that uh, we can substitute in. So for example, we're using a Prunus Carolineana, which is a non-native. Yeah. Uh, we can replace that with a, uh, um, the Prunus uh, elicifolia or even a um, Toyon, a Heteromeles uh, Toyon, we can, we can do that. Um, we've had some success with that. Um, you know, uh, uh, I know Irvine has a lot more clay soils, but we were able to uh, work with the city of Irvine and the Irvine company to use um, plants that were a little bit more native and, and, and they, they actually perform very well. So, uh, so another example is uh, we have lantana on the list. Lantana is great because it's got a lot of color. It's got color year round. Everybody knows how to maintain it. Um, but we could probably, uh, you know, uh, add in a few more salvias in there that would work. Um, so uh, even a, a monkey flower, a mimulus. So um, th there's, there's a couple options. And then uh, we have some aloes on the list. There's lots of uh, uh, plants that we actually can substitute kind of like for those aloes. Uh, even, th even though aloes are more native like to Mexico and um, there's probably like we could use like uh, some penstemon or cisrinchum, which they're, they're real small kind of uh, like uh, grassy things. So, so there, there are some options out there. Um, so uh, in, in that'd be, you know, if that's the direction that we want to go, I mean, we, we could do that. Um, and then there's, uh, we use, using some of the Calancho. The Calancho works really well with that uh, uh, agave blue glow, but the Calancho is not, not a native. So we could replace that with uh, either remove it or replace with something else. So in some areas, I, I wouldn't want to put a, like a, I would suggest using a Kia, but not necessarily in front of the blue glow. So I think we would just add more blue glow and then put the IKEA off to the sides of it. So, but there's some pretty vibrant color that you can get with IKEA, but also it doesn't look great for parts of the year. So, and, and then the real easy one is we're using a, a Sephora tree, which is more of a Texas native. And then we can replace that with Circe's, which is a California native. Everyone tells us Circe's doesn't grow in Costa Mesa, but I've probably planted, you know, I don't know, 200 of them. I mean, between Harbor Boulevard and Red Hill, they're all over. So we, we do know that it grows. In coast. The, the book is wrong on that one. <laughs> so so we, we do have some pretty good options. Um, some of the natives, uh, I mean, we're working on another uh, a project that's that's not far. It's, it's within 15 miles. And uh, a lot of the comments that we got from them, you know, were uh, the public would need to understand that these plants aren't going to look good 12 months out of the year. Uh, they could, you know, uh, look, you know, you know, there could be six months or, or extended periods where they just, they don't look that great. Um, but, you know, it's, so we try to avoid those, those plants, you know, uh, and then there are some that just don't want supplemental water. Everybody loves Ceanothus, uh, but I, I got it, I got to design it and I got to irrigate it for six months. And then I got to rely on, on the maintenance uh, team to remove the irrigation because at that point, it doesn't want supplemental water. Mm -hmm. So their water needs to kind of kind of change over over the course of, as, as they're becoming established. So so yeah, we 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 definitely have some options. Um, 
yeah, I just want to make sure that it's something that's going to be that's going to look nice, some that can be maintained. So some of the natives don't want to be maintained. So uh, when they start trimming them, that's that's when they really start to struggle. They just they just don't want to be touched. So yeah, so it's really if we want to add natives, it's really about getting the right natives, and then uh, um, kind of going into the third comment. If we want to design something that's really more of a demonstration garden, um, I'm all for that. That's great. And there's a lot of products out there that you can put plant tags. Um, that's something that that we could be involved in. It's something that maybe we don't need to be involved in. But we just want to make sure that we get a good plant tag that has the the. You want to get the name of the plant, the Latin, and the common name, and then it's it's nice to give them a little bit more information. And the direction that we're going with a lot of these. Uh, um, uh, demonstration gardens is we put QR codes on them and oh. those QR codes actually direct you to a website that you're hosting so that if you have information that was wrong you can actually update it or if you have better information but it it, it actually adds a whole another layer so you're going from essentially what is a turf renovation plan to an ornamental landscape uh, and then you're asking to go to what's more essentially uh, somewhere between a botanical garden and a demonstration garden. So there's a there's a there's a lot more effort in there for the designer, um, but there's also a lot more effort that has to come in from from you from the client, as in you're now hosting something that's uh, essentially a website. Uh, and then demonstration gardens really need like kind of moving into your third comment here. If you don't have programming, what's the point? So you need you need a space. If you can get the outdoor space, the outdoor space needs programming. And that's something that we've actually done before. Um, the programming for that space, there's so many different things you can do. You can do everything from how to trim a, a tree, how to, how to prune a shrub or tree, to how to compost. Um, what's the difference between actual like, you know, <laughs> composting and mulching? So, uh, so there's, I mean, as a, you know, a kind of educational thing, but then there's also what that plant identification or, and, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, uh, understanding like outreach as far as what plants to use or what plants work together. So a space becomes interesting because uh, if it's an outdoor classroom, uh, is it a, number one, is it an outdoor classroom or is it an outdoor laboratory? Do you want to incorporate, uh, I mean, programmatically, is it something where you're going to teach about irrigation, uh, how to put irrigation together, uh, what kind of irrigation application is there? And, there, and there's lots of places that actually have that ha do this now. Uh, I don't want to throw a lot of examples out there. I'll just talk about Dodger Stadium. Um, Dodger Stadium does all of this right in their parking lot. Mm -hmm. They don't have a fancy facility other than that they have a lot of landscape and they have a landscape crew that's very enthusiastic about sharing information. So they do this right in their parking lot. They have a irrigation demonstration set up um, and they talk about, I mean, they, they, they actually, they do a, a tour, but they also do a, a lot of outreach and, and educational. So that's why programming becomes so essential. Cause if you actually were to build an outdoor classroom, you get, you know, outdoor space, you get uh, some kind of shade structure and then you have it designed to meet your program. So, and, and that's actually what really makes it successful. If there's no ongoing programming, then, then, then there's really no reason to do the space. So, yes. So they're all great ideas. I love them. So, yeah. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. I, I just want to loop everyone else in. I had sent some comments by email just to try to get some preparation in advance of the meeting. and. And I meant them much more. I love the design. I'm so bummed to hear the meandering path isn't really feasible. Uh, I really thought that was lovely, but uh, but I, I think it's a yeah. beautiful design. I just um, I didn't know if these things things had already been considered, and since we were still already at the preliminary phase, I, I just kind of wanted to throw them out there since our district has such a focus on protecting public health and the environment, and um, always trying to find new ways to engage with our community. So. Um, and, and the, the biosphere, the rainwater catchment, I just was trying to think if there was some way, um, there's a lot of demonstration gardens. I know that uh, Mesa Water has at least three <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. quite a few. Uh, it, and then city of Huntington Beach has Shipley Park, which is a whole separate facility. Yes. But, um, but there's not a lot related to 
at least that I can find in North Orange County related to rainwater catchment, trying to at least minimize runoff into the street. So that's why I was kind of wondering if it's very difficult to find because uh, there's a when you get on that Irvine plateau, that's all heavy clay soil and that goes right into Tustin. That makes sense. So, yeah. And then there, there's a lot of locations in Irvine, especially in the, uh, the villages that are on the east side of the city. Um, so Cypress Village East and Cypress Village East East, uh, and then also north of the, uh, the Great Park. So where they have the stormwater uh, uh, retention uh, collection so and a lot of those uh, I did at the landscape on, on quite a few of those and they're all they're all very native um, and uh, it's it's great because it kind of keeps people out so, <laughs> and and you know they're 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 not right up front so it's the perfect opportunity it's perfect place for them they're great for birds um, because there's no traffic there's no people so um, it, it's actually pretty successful so and they're very much engineered they collect the water from that whole village. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's, it's, it's very functional, but also it's a very aesthetic design. And there's actually one that's just north of Red Hill, uh, right there at Barranca. I see. So I very, they're, they're very native. So, um, and they, uh, it's, uh, they look very native. So uh, they are also flammable. So there's always, uh, there's always that issue of uh, um, what the fuel modification is for a site like that. No, and I, and I appreciate uh, to your point about the California natives, I uh, California native plants. I um, I appreciate that they do go dormant in the summer, and some of them get quite. Uh, they look like they're basically dead. So I I can appreciate that uh, for a commercial property, we certainly don't want all of them to look like that in the summer. No. But but I appreciate what yeah. like you're saying about the laurels, maybe doing toy on and the salvias, mm -hmm. and that there may be some options we could at least mix in a little bit more to to try to. Because I do see more and more as I'm looking around, especially in South County, it seems like it's becoming more popular to put. And even in Fountain Valley, I've been noticing some commercial properties. They're definitely um, becoming more popular. So they're putting a lot I, of grasses in too, and a lot of these grasses aren't really as low water as they think they are. So, yes, that is so, yeah. <laughs> true enough. Um, yeah. But no, I, I can certainly appreciate the um, and also the flammability. I know there's ones like. Uh, I think it's lemonade berry and there are some that, that are more mm -hmm. retardant, but, but yes, no, I certainly, yeah, oh, I yeah. can appreciate all the different things you're trying to take into account. Yeah. I don't need the, uh, I don't need your insurance carrier to, to question yeah. the design is like, why are you doing this? Right. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. For the outside area, I, the demonstration guard, it, it may not, it may not end up being something viable, but I just wanted to throw it out there. If, um, if it if was something a larger consider. site. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, and the other thing is on that that north side, we, you wouldn't even really be able to do it on the north side because it's so shaded over there. Yeah. So and, and those trees would be coming out that are because there's trees there that are under the power lines. We I would see. replace those with smaller trees, but that side would still be very shady. So it, it wouldn't be a great area for natives. So um, yeah, if you had a larger site and we can kind of conceal it better from the uh, uh, public view mm -hmm. uh, where it actually could be a garden, let's say, I don't know if you've ever been to uh, Coachella Valley Water District headquarters. They have a very nice, it's a, it's a, it's essentially a demonstration garden, botanical oh. garden, and then they're actually looking to add programming to their garden. Okay. So, um, but it's not visible from the street and it's, it's the most incredible break area. So, um, and then in the evening they actually do classes and programming. So oh, how lovely. Very nice. Well, and, and Scott, I believe you, you uh, mentioned, I apologize if I missed it in the, uh, in all the paperwork, but there's a phase two where we could possibly have an outdoor space as well. Yes, we're, yes, uh, we we do plan on doing a phase two for uh, these improvements. Uh, most notably, be around the, the parking lot area where we we need to add some like ADA accessibilities into the area. Um, also, the the um, the trees along uh, adjacent to spectrums. So, you know, we're looking at maybe removing those trees, putting. A, a, um, improved lighting, like um, solar lighting maybe um, uh, it, for the parking lot. And maybe where there's right now, there's some existing um, concrete tables, kind of a picnic areas. It's not much of a picnic, but maybe we can expand that area and, and that could be a, a, a way to uh, have some meetings or, or at least have a nice area for, for the employees to have um, their lunch. Sure. So, I think Rosemary has, a, she, Rosemary has a question. She has her hands up, hand up. Okay. Rosemary, go ahead. Thank you. 
Um, I just wanted to sort of, I guess, um, it, well, say thank you, Eric. It's beautiful what you've presented so far. Uh, I am very interested in seeing uh, natives, if possible, um, um, swales for water retention or percolation. Um, and just whatever we can do to uh, promote sustainability in the community. Mm -hmm. I think um, the district is really asking a lot of the community when it comes to organics and um, segregating out organics so that they're proper, they're properly processed. And I think that's a, mm -hmm. uh, a type of sustainability. And I think that the landscape and the image that the district uh, projects should mirror what we're asking from the public. So I think like yeah. for a, a district to provide that leadership and like, hey, th this is something that that we do and it's something that you can do. I think the community really looks to um, districts, government and public agencies as role models. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lead by example. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think, Sue, do you have your hand up? Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you for the presentation and say that I'm I'm in favor for natives when it makes sense and they work. Um, I'm also in favor of as little as possible where it looks beautiful and sustains itself. And if there's a way, and I know Lantana is one of them, but if there are... Um, other flowers or plants that do flower that draw bees. I'm always in huge favor of that, especially on commercial property. Um, mm -hmm. Bees are kind of getting beat up in society yeah. right now, and we need them so desperately. So whenever there's an opportunity to make sure we have things that are bee friendly that aren't necessarily in a park, maybe where kids are going to get stung, or <laughs> much in favor of that. So that's great. Um, yeah, and. Uh... We get a lot more uh, um, positive feedback when we call it a pollinator garden or a butterfly garden. So, but essentially, yeah, we do that in a lot of our design just in general. So yes, um, because if you, for the most part, if you want that vibrant color that uh, comes with a, uh, you know, flower. So um, yes, so yeah, definitely pollinators. And uh, even when we design parks, we always, parks are, are uh, active and passive at the same time. So when you get in the back corner of a park, uh, that's where we try to incorporate stuff that's more of that pollinator, you know, like a butterfly garden. So, yeah. Great. So, Thank you again. Thank you. All right. Does anyone else have any other comments? I don't see any hands up. No? Okay. Well, with that, thank you so much for presenting this. It's just, Eric, it was, I think the design is gorgeous. Uh, thank you. Thank you for everything, walking us through the challenges and how it all came kind of evolved. And I didn't realize the background with the city. So thank you for clarifying all that too. Um, oh, no worries, anytime. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to head on out from the meeting here. <laughs> yes, head over to the kitchen. You. Thank you. We'll be, I'll be in touch with you tomorrow. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Have Thanks a good everybody. night. All right. Good night. Oh, okay. So let's jump back to item B1. Approve the Citizens Advisory Committee meeting minutes of November 10th, 2021. Um, has any, everyone had a chance to review these? Would anyone yes, like to yes, make I a did. motion? Oh, good. Excellent. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve them? <laughs> uh, I no, make move. a motion to approve. Second. Okay. So let's see, Seth, Seth uh, yes. motion, first motion, Cindy is the second, okay. Uh, all those in favor of approving the minutes as presented, the, the November 10th, 2020, 2021 meeting minutes, um, please say aye. 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 <laughs> any opposed? And any abstentions? Okay, motion carries, thank you. Okay, so that brings us to item B2, uh, results of the 2021 citizen survey. Yes, thank you, Chair Katz. 
So every two years, the, the district uh, wants to engage with, with our residents by, by conducting a, a community-wide survey. So uh, 2021 was, uh, it was the year for us to conduct our, our next survey. Uh, this time, this, in 2021, we, we wanted to expand um, the number of participants to 1,000, to, to at least reach 1,000 residents uh, on the survey. Uh, our consultant actually reached almost 1,200 which was fantastic. Um, we uh, did my, we did, I was trying to uh, have the results presented to you at your November 10th meeting, but it was just too tight. The consultant couldn't, couldn't get his report on time. Um, so uh, he did share it, the, his findings with the board of directors in the November meeting. And what was really important about this survey is what, again, um, one, we want to engage our level of service with, with the community, but, but other issues that were important to us to find out from, from the community is um, on the solid waste side, as you know, um, SB 1383 is uh, in effect right now, right? So we have to, we right now have to educate our, the public about um, uh, throwing your, your food scraps uh, in your green can, right? You can no longer go into trash. And so for the next two years, that's what we've been doing is educating the public about uh, this new law. And one big difference we might have to do is go to a three cart system, right? So right now we have a two cart system where you throw your organics and your food scraps in the green waste. And then you have your, your mixed waste carts where you throw your, your trash and your recyclables. Well, the problem with that system, well, even though it's acceptable by, by um, the state regulators, uh, if you use a two-card system, you have to take that materials to what's considered a high diversion facility. And what CRNR is telling us is that they don't have a high diversion facility. So it looks like we might have to go to a three-card system. Before we do that, we want to engage with the public to say, hey, would you accept a three-card system? Meaning you'd have one card for your trash, for, which we like a black card for your trash, and then you get a new card, a blue card, for your recyclables, and then you continue using your green card for your, your green waste and um, food scraps. So the results were quite interesting, and uh, we're, we're happy to share you those results uh, tonight. What I'm going to do is we're going to show with you um, the audio, the, the video recording of the consultants' presentations to the board of directors. So this was, in, I believe, in the November meeting, and then once that recording um, was done, what, we, staff is available to answer any questions. So um, Nalani, if you can cue that up for the um, um, presentation. I Please. have that cute, Scott. Um, Madam Chair, I have Rosemary's hand raised now. Did you want to address that now or later? Um, Rosemary, is it, is it relevant to the survey? It's in regards to Scott's comments about um, CRRNA's um, ability to uh, that high diversion facility. Yes. Okay. That's okay. Go ahead. So, how long is the contract with CRNR? It's with uh, it's ten years with uh, an option of ten years, uh, an additional ten year extension. So, with how far said, are we in that ten years? How far? Well, right now, it's two years, but there's a caveat to that. Right now, um, we are going to begin negotiations because of thirteen eighty three. We are going to begin a new negotiations with CRNR to provide some public outreach for thirteen eighty three. So, so those terms um, and conditions could change. Could you ask CRNR to? Uh, divert materials, even if they don't have their own um, facility to process materials to another to subcontract to another. That's a good uh, question. Processor? Yes, yeah, that's actually not a bad idea. We we could ask that. Um, there'll probably be a cost to that, right? So, um, but that that's that's a very good point. I'll, I'll I'll make note of that. We can we can ask that in our negotiations. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that's a discussion whether it's more cost benefit to get the third card or to try and negotiate with the hauler right. to subcontract that out. Thank you. Thank you. Good, Thank good, you, good Rosemary. Comments. Okay. Okay, I'll queue up the video. Thank you, and Madam Chair, if you'll just let me know if you're able to see and hear it, that'll be helpful. Okay. Scott, and uh, good evening, members of the board. Yep. Tim McClarney with Truth North Research. Uh, we are a firm that over the last 20 years has specialized in working with public agencies around the state and using surveys to develop a statistically reliable understanding of the communities and the customers they serve. Um, to date, we've uh, designed and conducted over a thousand research studies for public agencies. And much of the work that we do is what we call customer satisfaction studies, similar to what we're going to be talking about tonight, and that Scott just reviewed quickly, where the goal is really to understand sort of what are your customers' awareness of you and as a district and the services you provide, uh, what's their experience using these services, 
and also what their opinions and satisfaction are with respect to the service you provide. Um, uh, at the board's pleasure, I'm going to share my screen here and bring up a PowerPoint uh, presentation and I'll walk you through. Everybody see that, I hope? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, and as I go through this presentation, which covers the highlights of the survey results, I welcome questions from the board as I go or at the end, whichever is your preference. There is a more detailed report uh, that provides additional uh, information, usually subgroup breakouts beyond what we're going to be talking about here tonight. And so with that, let me go ahead and jump into the survey results. Um, Scott did a good job uh, reviewing, uh, providing an overview of what the purpose of the study was. Um, and, and so I won't hit on that uh, here uh, in, in much greater detail, except you know, as he did mention, one of the goals of the study was to understand what are your customers' experiences with the two-cart system and what are their attitudes about switching to a three-cart system. So uh, a fair chunk of the survey questions that were towards the back of the survey really focused on that. And um, we've got some clear uh, indication there as well. So um, now before we talk about the results, it's helpful to take a moment to review the purpose of the study. I mean, the, the methodology of the study or how we went about conducting the survey. Uh, survey was conducted in October, uh, late October and early November of this year, and we wound up speaking with a, a little over 1,100 customers uh, who receive sewer and, and trash services for some of them. So not all customers uh, receive trash service, as you know, all your customers do receive sewer. And so what we did to, to sort of pull the sample for this study is we went to uh, the, the district's customer database, uh, which is parcel based because a lot of the uh, sewer customers who may not be trash customers are um, uh, multifamily parcels. We then unpacked that customer database uh, so that single parcels that have multi, a lot of multifamily units would be unpacked in discrete housing units. We're able to pin some, uh, some additional information to that file. So we were able to reach out to uh, customers and their natural proportions based on whether they are a sewer customer uh, a trash customer or both. Um, once we had uh, created that random sample, uh, we use what's called a mixed method approach for recruiting and data collection. What that means is we reach out to customers using multiple methods. Uh, we could contact them by email, text, and telephone. Uh, and we allowed them to participate either by phone or online at a password protected website at their uh, discretion and preference. Survey was conducted in English and Spanish. It's a kind of a long instrument, average 19 minutes uh, for the telephone interview. Now, because this was a random sample of 1,128 of your customers and not a census of all your customers that has what's known as a margin of error due to sampling, in this case, that is plus or minus 2.9%. What that means is we can be 95% confident that the results I'll share with you this evening are within 2.9% of what we would have found had we spoken with all of your uh, residential customers. So on to the results. Uh, this first slide, uh, we open up the survey uh, asking a little bit about um, how aware they are of the district, uh, how favorable are their opinions of the district, uh, and how familiar they are with the district. And so this first slide uh, is the results of the question prior to taking the survey, had you ever heard of the Costa Mesa Sanitary, Costa Mesa Sanitary District? Uh, for being a sanitary, dis sanitary district, a special district, in particular, a district that doesn't uh, engage in direct billing, your levels of awareness are quite high. You have 87% of your customers say that they had heard of the district prior to taking the survey. Awareness was a bit higher for homeowners and also those who receive trash service in addition to sewer services. Um, for those customers who were familiar with... Uh, who, <laughs> Tim, Tim, yes. uh, do you do you have uh, the numbers from the previous survey? You know, that's one of the questions that was asked. There were a lot of the questions in the previous survey that were not asked in a comparable way, right? So there was an yeah. interest in updating the survey to improve the validity and the reliability of the, of the <laughs> questions. And so for many of these, I don't have the direct comparisons. There are a few in the report that you can kind of look and say, well, it's not quite exactly apples to apples, but it's um, you know, close enough to make some comparisons, but we don't have the direct one on this. Thank you. Sure. So after measuring awareness, we went on for those folks who were aware of the district prior to taking the survey, we asked them to tell us how familiar they are with the district. On this pie chart, what we have done is combined the answers to the prior question with this question so that the pie chart represents 
all of your customers. And what you see here is that you had about 41% who said they're, they're either very familiar or somewhat familiar with the district. You had about 31% who were slightly familiar. Uh, and then you had another about 29% who said either originally they'd never heard of the district or although they'd heard of the district, uh, they're not at all familiar with the district. Um, here again, we did see that familiarity with the district was generally higher among your homeowners, as well as those who receive uh, trash services in addition to sewer services, also tended to be a little higher among your older customers, meaning 45 years or older, um, and those who took the survey in English. And then finally, we went on to ask customers where they had a very uh, favorable, somewhat favorable, somewhat unfavorable, or very unfavorable opinion of the Costa Mesa Sanitary District, or if they have no opinion either way. And what you see here is that on the far left, this is your overall column among all respondents. We have about 30% who don't know enough about the district to venture a, an opinion on this question, right? Um, so although they've heard of you, they don't know enough about you to have an opinion. Among those with an opinion, though, you can see they are decidedly favorable, right? You had about 60% of your customers say that they have a favorable opinion compared to about 9% we have an unfavorable opinion, that's a ratio of about six to one. You do see to the right, we have it broken down according to how familiar they said they were uh, with the district prior to taking the survey. And you can see that as the familiarity with the district grows, so too does the likelihood that they have a favorable opinion of the district and particularly that they have a very favorable in the district. So the more they know you, the more they like you. Um, so shifting gears here, these next two questions are in some ways the most important uh, slides that I'm going to show you. And the first one here is the answers to the question, overall, are you satisfied or dissatisfied with the job the Costa Mesa Sanitary District is doing to provide sewer and wastewater services to your household? And you see that overall 79%, so about eight out of 10 customers indicated that they were satisfied. You had just 4% who indicated they were dissatisfied with the remainder being unsure. So uh, very high levels of satisfaction for your sewer and wastewater services. Same question, only this time we're focusing on trash recycling and green waste collection. Overall, how satisfied or dissatisfied are they with that service? And you see here also we have 79% or almost eight out of 10 uh, customers who receive trash services indicate that they are satisfied. Uh, you had about 19% who said they were dissatisfied and about two and a half percent who said they were not sure or prefer not to answer. Not shown here, but shown in the report. Um, we did ask an open-ended question for those who were dissatisfied to tell us why. And what you found is that the most common reasons were uh, not having recycling bins or recycling services available to them. So I, you know, as you read the survey results, one thing you do get the impression is that not all customers sort of understand th that. Um, how the recycling process works, um, get with the two cart system, and some um, feel like, you know, why don't we have recycling here? Um, and so that was listed as one of the reasons for not being dissatisfied. And then also inconsistent or unreliable pickup of trash. So about 37% of those people who were in the dissatisfied column mentioned something about the consistency and reliability of, of trash pickup. And this is, uh... Vice President Schaefer, Mike, in the the folks that were dissatisfied, you said you asked why they were dissatisfied. Mm -hmm. Was there any mention of missed trash pickups in any of that? Well, that's what, yes, there, there is. That's what I was saying there is if you took all the people here who were dissatisfied, either somewhat or very, and we asked them to say why, there were really two dominant answers as to why they were dissatisfied. One which is the most common, was that they didn't have recycled bins or recycling service, right? So they want, this is where I say, I think some of them don't quite understand how the recycling gets separated later on the two cart system. And so right. They, right. Were, they were saying that that's the reason they're satisfied. They want this sort of dedicated recycling bin. 37%, right? The second most common response was something to do with inconsistent and unreliable pickup of trash. So you know, not getting their trash picked up when they're supposed to be um, and or not 
having all the trash dumped out. You see this in a couple other questions in the survey where there's concerns that, hey, yeah, well, they may have come, but you know, I came out and my bins are still a third full or something like that, right? Um, but it was that so about you know, 37% of those people who are dissatisfied mentioned something about inconsistency in trash pickup. Thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> moving on, uh, we did ask uh, customers uh, a couple questions about how they've reached out to either the district or CRNR in the last year. And so for all customers, we asked them during the past 12 months, had they contacted the Costa Mesa Sanitary District by telephone, email, text, a smartphone app, or in person? And you had about one out of five customers say yes to that, 22%. Um, we went on to ask those uh, customers who had contact with the district how they would rate staff at the district. Are they very professional, somewhat professional, not at all professional, et cetera, on each of the dimensions you see there on the bottom of the slide? And what you see is staff gets high marks. <clears throat> Keep in mind that most times when customers reach out to the district, or to a public agency like this, they've got a problem, right? That, that there, there's something that uh, is bothering them in one way or another, right? And they're reaching out with that issue. And usually that's starting the conversation off kind of on a difficult foot, right? And so the fact that your staff can uh, come away from that experience with customers saying, you know, that, yeah, we, we, we see them as being professional and helpful and accessible and knowledgeable, that's great. Um, we also asked customers who were trash customers whether during the past 12 months they had contacted the waste hauling company CRNR by telephone, email, text, a smartphone app, or in person. Here you see a somewhat higher percentage had done this, almost a third, right? 32% had done this in the past year. And we asked uh, those customers whether or not um, the reason they, excuse me, they had contacted CNR was resolved to their satisfaction in a timely manner. And you see that um, for the most part, 80% of those customers who had reached out to CNR, r, &R in the past year indicated yes, that their issue, the reason they called them or contacted them was resolved to their satisfaction in a timely manner. That said, we also asked individuals excluding holidays during the past 12 months have there been any occasions when your trash and recycling carts were not emptied by CRNR on your regularly scheduled collection day? So this speaks to the issue that was raised here a minute ago. And what you find is about 40%, so 39% of your trash customers indicated yes, even once you exclude holidays, there's been at least one occasion in the past year where their trash has not been uh, emptied uh, on a regularly scheduled day. I will say that there also seems to be a very strong correlation between how customers answer this question and their overall level of satisfaction with their trash service, right? So um, if somebody said uh, that their trash was occasionally not picked up on the regularly scheduled day, they are much more likely than their counterparts to be a dissatisfied customer when it comes to trash service in general. Okay, so moving on beyond sort of the broad question about trash collection and uh, sewer services, uh, we also uh, dug in to with customers to talk about each of the special programs that you see here on this slide. And the first question we asked for each one of these programs was uh, whether they were aware that the district offers these programs. And you can see that there's uh, quite a bit of variation on the slide. Uh, the top two here, large item trash collection service, as well as curbside organics, recycling of green waste and or food waste. Both of those programs have very high levels of awareness, 80% and 70% respectively. But once you get below that, the awareness levels fall off um, pretty sharply. Uh, about 16% were aware the door-to-door -door hazardous, household hazardous waste collection program, 12% the Sharps container disposal, 10% the American flag retirement program, and about 7% the sewer inspection rebate program. Now, having figured out who was aware of these programs, we also went on to ask those individuals whether their household had ever utilized those programs. And you can see that the utilization rate is pretty high, 39% uh, and 36% respectively. But as you might imagine, if the level of awareness for the, the programs below 
uh, was low. That means that the percentage of households that have used these programs is even lower, uh, ranging from about 1% to 3% across those four programs at the bottom. Now, although the rate of utilization for these programs was, for some of these programs was low, customer satisfaction with these programs is quite high, right? And so for every respondent who had actually reported they had used one of these programs, we simply asked them to tell us whether they're satisfied or dissatisfied. And you can see that satisfaction ranged anywhere from 87% at the bottom to 96% at the top. So uh, among those who have utilized these programs, they're, they're very happy with them. It's just that the awareness level and use for some of those programs is, 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 is a bit low. Uh, so as promised at the outset of this presentation that we were gonna have a series of questions related to the two-cart system as well as the three-cart system. Uh, and so the first of these questions, uh, first we sort of described to customers that the, that the district currently uses a two-cart system where trash and recyclables are placed together in one cart and green waste and food scraps are placed into a separate organics recycling cart. And overall, are they satisfied or dissatisfied with the two cart system? And you can see that more than two thirds of customers indicated that they are satisfied with the two cart system. You had about 15% who were dissatisfied and the rest either saying they don't have an organics recycling cart or they prefer not to answer. Now, for those customers who said they were dissatisfied with the two cart system, we went on to ask them why in an open-ended manner. Um, they got to tell us in their own words what it was that uh, was troubling them. And then we went back and looked at those verbatim responses and grouped them into the categories that you see here. And you can see that, um, as I mentioned earlier, there seems to be a little bit of confusion among some customers about how the recycling process works in a two-cart system. Um, the top complaint about the two-cart system was that there's no recycling bins or service provided. About 25% mentioned that. Another 25% mentioned that they want, you know, that the bins are unsatisfactory in some way. They either want more of them, they want better bins, they need larger bins. And about 16% just said we need better recycling bin information and process. So here we are again, you know, there's a certain percentage of customers who obviously aren't clued into, you know, how the recycling works. And for some of them, that's, that's the issue. Um, so after that, we went on to sort of introduce the three-cart system. We said that, that although the, the district currently uses a two-cart system for trash and recycling, California, uh, new regulations from the state of California may require that the district move to a three-cart system where the household will have one cart for discarding trash, one cart for recyclables, and a third cart for green waste and food scraps. Do they support or oppose moving to a three-cart system or do they have no opinion either way? And you can see that although previously we found that most customers were satisfied with the two cart system, we also find that a majority um, are uh, supportive of moving to a three cart system, 58%, uh, with about 30% saying they oppose and the remainder uh, being unsure. Mm. For. Wait, sorry, can oh, I? Uh, can I uh, this is uh, Brett Eccles, just a quick question on the previous, that slide and the previous one. So from the questions and then the answers that you all received uh, seemed like the satisfaction was was okay. And then the dissatisfaction, the two cart was bigger, better, more type carts. Was, it, was there a differentiation between, do you truly understand what the three cart is or are you just looking for more trash bins basically? Was there a little differentiation you do see, you do see that it, it's kind of a bottom line is you're going to have some customers who prefer the two cart and some customers that prefer the three cart, right? right? And you do see that some of the customers that aren't as happy with the two cart because of the lack in their eyes of a, a, of a dedicated recycling bin, they do tend to gravitate towards a three cart, right? Solution, right? But then you'll have customers who are happy with two cart solution that when they get to the three cart, some of them, as we'll see here in a minute, have the reasons for why they don't like the three cart, right? Um, and so, the, you know, both of these systems have their supporters. Like there's a certain group of, there's a lot of customers who would go with either, right? They're happy with either. And then there's some who clearly prefer one or the other. And the reason why I ask is just from my experience and people who've talked to me, a lot of people want their bigger bins back. So is this a, that's what I'm kind of wondering, is it so much 
oh, we really want the recycle bin, or do we just want more right. bin space? And I that's what, what I'm saying. Uh, I, I think that's this group right here. So, you know, about 25% of those who said, I don't like the two card system, right? They're, they mentioned, you know, I want larger bins. I want better bins, I need more bins, right? So that's probably a capacity issue versus the other two uh, statements there that are more about not sort of, I guess, understanding how the recycling process works and feeling like maybe the recycling isn't being done as well because it's getting lumped in with the trash, right? Um, so you're getting a mix of both. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we saw the support for moving to a three-cart system. For those who oppose moving to a three-cart system, here are those open-ended responses as to why. And here you have kind of that group who's taking the op opposite perspective, right? We had certain customers who don't like two-cart system because they want more bins and capacity. When you ask the folks who were dissatisfied, who don't want to uh, move to a three-cart system, why you get about a third who mentioned that's too many bins to store or move, or it's going to be difficult to, you know, have parking around these things. Um, you have about 31% uh, who basically said they don't want to separate in materials, right? So they're kind of comfortable throwing it all in the trash bin and letting somebody else separate it. Mm -hmm. um, and then 19% mentioned that, you know, the, the current two cart system is fine. It's not necessary to change, right? So this is again among people who said that's about 30% of folks who said they didn't support moving to a three cart system. Um, now, Tim, before you move away from that, did, nobody mentioned, I mean, when, it, when you talk about a three cart system, we get a lot of input, um, not from the public, but probably from other electeds and things that say, we don't want three trucks on the street because it's going to do more damage to the infrastructure and the roads. Nobody mentioned that at all. I, I, I my suspicion <sighs> is that something that doesn't really occur to the average person, right? Um, yeah. That that we're looking now at three carts. I'm yeah, sorry, I, three, three trucks. We, I mean, we hear that a lot. I mean, people say to us, mm -hmm. "You can't put three trucks in one day on the street. It's going to ruin the streets." And uh, so it's interesting for me to look at this chart and realize, that, and, and you're, I think you're right. I, I believe you're right in that the public just isn't aware. They, they're not even sure there's going to be three trucks. They might think that one truck is divided into separate. Maybe CRNR could get trucks that have three distinct areas in them, right? <laughs> they're shaking their heads no, I guess. <laughs> second half. These so. figures don't even account for the cities. So yeah. <laughs> Right, you know, they don't account for the city. They don't account for the city's pickup system. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, now, one of the interesting questions that was part of the 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 sort of discussion and motivating, quite frankly, the, the discussion around a three cart system, we wanted to provide a little background to respond it. So we said. Um, we first asked them before we introduced the three cart system, approximately what percentage of their household's total food waste is placed in the organics recycling cart. So way over here on the left, you see the current distribution. The easiest way to look at this is I usually take these two bottom boxes here, add them together, and you see you've got 21% of your customers who are currently placing 50% or more, right? At least 50% of their food waste in the organics recycling bin. We then, for the middle column, introduced a little later in the survey, uh, the idea that when dumped in a landfill, organic waste such as green waste and food scraps generates a lot of greenhouse gases and contributes to a warming climate. Next year, a new state law will go into effect requiring that a high percentage of organic waste be recycled to better address climate change. So with this new law in place, approximately what percentage of your household's total food waste do you anticipate placing in the organics recycling bin? And so when you put it, when you introduce the concept of the new law, you can see that support goes up. You've got about 38% here of folks who say that we're going to put at least 50% of our food waste in the organics recycling bin. This final column is when we introduce a little tack on. We said, and by the way, the new state law also requires fines 
be issued to households and businesses that do not place their food scraps in an organic recycling cart. And knowing this, actually what percentage of your household's total food do you realistically anticipate placing in the organic recycling cart? And you can see that you get a bit of a bump, right? But even under those scenarios, you have a little less than half here, right? 46% who said that they would put at least half of their or of their food scraps into their organics recycling bin once that new law takes effect. So it gives you a sense of what amount of behavior change uh, you might anticipate from folks uh, after the new year. Switching gears yet again, um, we uh, informed customers who are trash and recycling customers that single family homes currently pay $21.45 per month for trash collection and recycling services. Do you think this amount is reasonable, too high or too low? And what you see here on the slide is there is a pretty widespread recognition among your customers that what is being charged for trash and recycling services is reasonable, right? 71% uh, felt that way. You had just 15% who said that's too high. Um, you know, I can tell you that I, I, uh, I'm in a different part of Southern California with my office, and I think I pay $52 a month, something like that. <laughs> and it's technically residential uh, 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 services, so more than double what we're seeing here in, in your community. And, and, you, and that's reflected, I think, in, these, in this pie chart, right, that most customers you see. You Beverly Hills? I do not. I live down in <laughs> North County, San Diego. So uh, we also, though, for those customers who were sewer customers, which is everybody, right, uh, we informed them that single family homes pay $7.70 per month for sewer services, and which is also one of the lowest rates in Orange County. And would they support increasing the sewer rate to $15 per month, so basically doubling the current rate, uh, in order to provide the funds needed to repair, maintain, and improve the sewer system? Uh, you had 42% of customers who said, yes, I would support that, about 32% who did not support it, and the remainder being unsure. Um, so all in all, you know, considering you're kind of hitting them cold turkey, uh, that's not bad. Uh, and um, obviously with sewer rate increases, I believe, normally if it's under Prop 218, it's a protest vote. I don't know how it would work in your case because it's tied to your uh, tied to your property taxes, right? Okay, um, and then as we wrapped up the survey, we did ask a couple questions about communication, uh, one of which was, in the past 12 months, have you visited the, the Costa Mesa Sanitary District's website? You had about 22% of folks say they had in the last year, and when we asked them to tell us how satisfied or dissatisfied they were with the information available on the website and the level of transparency it provides, you can see that you had high levels of satisfaction, 70%. Said they were satisfied, just six percent who said they were dissatisfied. So, as I've gone through all these slides, by the way, we're just giving you kind of the overall pie chart picture, right? For all your customers in the report, there's a lot of breakdowns by different customer subgroups. So, you can see, you know, which customers tended to go see to the website and if they're, you know, how did satisfaction levels uh, range across your subgroups? So that information is available. So what does all this mean? Um, I go into detail in the report, so I'll be brief here. I think the first sort of takeaway, um, considering this is a customer satisfaction survey, is to understand kind of how we're doing as a district, right? Overall, uh, how, what do your customers think of you? And I think this is a very positive report card in that respect. We saw that the awareness levels for the district were quite high, 87%. This is, again, high for a special district, particularly one that doesn't do direct billing. Um, and we found that among customers with an opinion of the district, uh, the unfavor—I mean, the favorable opinions outnumber the unfavorable opinions by a ratio of six to one. Right, so that's all good news. Um, we saw that you know the vast majority of your residential customers, about eight in ten, were satisfied both with your sewer services as provided as well as your trash recycling services. Um, for those who had reached out to the district in the past year. Uh, staff received high marks for their professionalism, accessibility, knowledge, and helpfulness. And CRNR uh, appears to be doing a good job in terms of sort of converting customer reach outs, which usually are, you know, customers have a problem of some sort, into uh, satisfaction, right? That 80% that of the customers who had reached out to CRNR in the past year 
uh, about some issue indicated that the issue was resolved uh, to their satisfaction in a timely manner. So that's all good news. That's just a, a positive report card. Like any customer satisfaction survey, it should be a little bit about how are we doing today, but also a little bit about where can we improve in the future. And there are a couple opportunities that popped up, areas that popped up. Um, improvements in trash collection, mainly in terms of consistency, thoroughness, and cleanliness. What I mean by that is we saw in there that customers who were, uh, there were some, you know, uh, customers who had experienced that, hey, our trash isn't getting collected on the day it's supposed to, um, that that all that can lead to overall dissatisfaction with their with their service. Um, and also some customers were complaining that, you know, their trash bins aren't getting thoroughly emptied when they are getting picked up. And so that's one obvious uh, opportunity area uh, that could be worked on. And also increasing customer awareness of some of those special programs that you offer. Um, we saw that you know, the customers who were aware of those programs and used them had very high levels of satisfaction, right? They liked the programs. The, the challenge really is that there's, for several of those programs, the levels of awareness are just low. And so helping customers become aware of these programs, I think will, uh, you know, to the extent that they then use them, uh, that's going to be a, a plus in terms of their overall interactions with the district and, and will lead to greater overall satisfaction uh, in general. And then finally, key conclusions regarding the two cart or three cart system. You know, as we talked about before, I think, you know, we found that most customers express satisfaction with the current two cart system and that the complaints about that system tend to focus on the absence of recycling bins, uh, perhaps a little bit of confusion about how the recycling process works for the two cart system and a desire for better and larger bins, possibly just more capacity. Um, but we also found when we introduced the three cart system that the majority of customers were interested and supportive of switching to the, to the three cart system. Uh, those who were not tended to be concerned with just the need to store more bins um, or uh, just didn't like the idea of having to sort through materials and prefer just to be able to dump it all into uh, one bin as they are currently doing for the most part, um, or they just felt that the change was unnecessary. And so with that, I end my presentation. I'm, I welcome any additional questions or comments from the board. Roy, let's, let's stop the uh, presentation right there. <laughs> so that was it. it was, as you can see, it was quite, quite interesting. Uh, I found it was quite interesting that 71% of, of the residents support the two carts, but then again, majority of the residents were okay with the three cart system. So, so that was interesting as well. But uh, it, it's always good to do these surveys every two years to engage where our, our residents uh, feel about us, about the level of service we're providing and where we can identify any kind of improvements. So uh, I thought it was uh, very well done by, by that consultant. So happy to answer any questions you may have. I have more uh, of a see. statement. Yes. Is that Daniel? Yes. Okay, Daniel, go ahead. I'd go just ahead. like to um, note or, or make a... Um, a suggestion that regardless of the two or three carts, I feel that um, we need to make it more of an emphasis that our um, residents are aware that we are doing um, a recycling project or there's some sort of recycling being done because that was what stand out the most to me. They weren't aware that there is recycling being done if it's two carts or three carts. Good point, thank you. Okay, I see two hands up. Uh, why don't we start with Rosemary and then Sue? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, mention also that the two to three carts also has to do with diversion rates. So if you're going to a dirty MRF with two carts, your diversion rate may not be as high as if you had a third cart and a mature recycling. Uh, program. So that's something to consider. The other thing that I found fascinating about this survey was the area that seemed like uh, that needed the most improvement had to do with the contractor. It's not about the district. It's about the contractor and it's the big contractor, CRNR. And so um, my comment or thought on this is that if that contract is being uh, opened back up, to include uh, requirements for a customer survey, um, uh, customer service survey 
to be implemented and possibly paid for by CRNR, and then to have some, I guess, just to hold them accountable for customer service. I mean, if they're missing um, a lot of individual customers or entire streets, there, there needs to be more than just a, oh, sorry about that, or we'll get back to that customer later today or in the next day or whatever it is, but to really uh, hold them accountable for that because you would do that if it was a landscaper that didn't mow your grass at a certain point, you wouldn't right. pay them or they would have a financial consequence to that. So something to consider. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Good good comments. Thank you. I wrote those down. Thank, Thank you. you, Rosemary. Okay, Sue. Uh, um, because we're on the topic of most of the complaints were about missed trash pickups. Could you just share with um, the members of the CAC the Cliff Notes version of the benchmark study that you guys just went over with the study session? Because I don't know how many people watched the study session. I did. Sure. To kind of give them an idea of what that benchmark study covered, because it kind of falls in with the 40% dissatisfaction rate of the trash not being picked up and also some of the topics that um, Rosemary just hit on. Sure, sure, absolutely, I'd be happy to. So, so last year, CNR requested a 5.8% uh, fee adjustment to what they're charging us for um, collecting and, and, and disposing and processing um, recycling solid waste. Staff uh, recommendation was deny the request because of their customer service, of their recent uh, lack of service of missed collections. Uh, we, we meaning staff, didn't believe they, they earned it because of all the complaints we were getting. Uh, the, the board did agree with staff and denied the request. However, they did open the door a little bit and said, well, let's come back in six months and evaluate their performance in six months. And let's, let's approve some uh, benchmarks that they can try to achieve. And if they achieve those benchmarks, then maybe we can consider uh, a fee adjustment. And so in, in June, staff uh, presented to the board and the board adopted uh, about eight benchmarks. And those benchmarks included um, reducing the number of complaints from, from last year by 50%, um, in, uh, reducing the number of Christmas tree recycling complaints, um, making sure we have new vehicles, uh, new, new, new vehicles in the fleet um, um, that are um, available. Uh, so those are some of the, some of the benchmarks I, I recall. So, Yesterday, we presented the, the full six month of data and um, CNR did not achieve uh, most of the benchmarks. I think the, of the eight, they only achieved two of them. And the board still denied their request. It was a three, two vote, but they still denied their request. Um, but we are, we are going to negotiations here. And so, um, you know, uh, we can determine what kind of cost that, that can be. But, but what, what's, um, um, Committee member Lester has mentioned we I do believe we we have successfully held uh, CNRs accountable by denying their their request and and making sure that they continue performing that services those benchmarks uh, we will continue monitoring for another six months uh, we will still want to hold them accountable and making sure that they're they're they are improving their services now I do have to I do have to say this I'm not trying to defend their their performance or anything but but um, CNR did indicate to us that they have 40 drivers out on COVID right now. And so, so, but those, those drivers aren't with our, our fleet. So, but, but they have other cities are impacting um, uh, around, around their services there. But still um, I was, I was pleased that the board denied their, their request and, and um, um, hold them accountable. Thank you, Scott. I, I see Rosemary has her hand up. Scott, I just wanted to add also that the fact that your staff, because there's poor customer service that's occurring and that staff has to monitor um, these calls coming into the district that my trash or my service isn't, uh, my, my, my trash wasn't collected, there's a cost to the district for that also. And so that's why I mentioned like an independent study where CRNR is um, paying to have that study conducted so that it's takes less of that burden off or it takes more of the burden off of your staff yeah no this is great i'm going to definitely add that to our, our on our table when we negotiate with them this, that was a great suggestion thank you uh sue 
Scott, you guys go above and beyond, in my opinion, in, in terms of trying to educate our rate payers and get feedback and things like that. Um, with the passing of SB 1383, should be doing the same thing, considering they passed an ordinance saying that they're going to enforce this. But I live in part of the demographic that is not served by the sanitary district or crickets mm -hmm. from the city. So are, are you guys, have you heard anything from them on if they're she froze, she froze up. Uh, I, I think, I think if, if the question is if I heard anything from, from the city regarding um, SB 1383, and, and yes, they, they have adopted an ordinance. They actually adopted one before we did. Like uh, what and, are they doing to do their part? Yes, so as I mentioned, they, they did adopt an ordinance. Um, uh, they adopted one before we did. Uh, they are working, they have, as you know, in, in, in Costa Mesa on, on the multifamily units in the commercial, they have what's called an open market. So they have several um, um, haulers um, that provide the service, I believe, that the city is going to planning on on going to have one exclusive franchise hauler. I think they're waiting for those 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 terms or those um, uh, those contracts with those other haulers to expire, and then they're going to go out to bid and have one hauler provide that service, an exclusive franchise hauler to provide that service for all multifamily units and um, uh, businesses, uh, which will be easier to manage on the city's part. Um, they are um, again, they're it's I think they're leaving it up to the haulers to, to um, educate uh, the residents and uh, the commercial the commercial accounts about SB 1383. Uh, we are doing some some coordinations with, with the city as well. Uh, but uh, uh, again, the SB 1383 just kicked off. So, so we're, we're still, we're still uh, learning as we go. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I see we're about to run out of time. Um... Does anyone have any other comments about the survey? No, okay. I mean, if you okay. want to, if you want to move on, I, I can go through the PAFR real quick or we can we can put that on the next um, agenda. It's up to you. The next, uh, next uh, which will be uh, March. We can put on the on the March agenda. Um, it's pretty detailed. Do you think, I mean, I don't know that we could cover it even in 10 minutes. Um, is the, uh, I forget how much stuff we had planned for the March. Uh, I, I don't know either. I guess. I, yeah, I don't either. Um, I think we may need to postpone it. Okay. Okay. I will. I will put it on the. Um, uh, I'll put it first on the agenda for uh, the March. Agenda. Okay. Thank you. I apologize, Caitlin. I, I see you're you're on. I apologize that we didn't catch that. We should have had that go first. Um, I, I had a quick question though. It, since we're not getting to that about the survey. Um, after the last survey, one of the biggest concerns at the time was it was changing behavior and trying to increase use of the organics recycling, but it was uh, but it was also awareness of the district, and that was one of the primary reasons we brought in Tripepi Smith. Yes, um, I forget which board member asked about that, but as far as trying to compare the previous survey's results about awareness of the uh, sanitary district versus what they asked this time and what the result was. Is there any, I understand the questions weren't exactly the same, but is there any sense of if we've improved and how having brought them in has helped the yeah, district? I, yes, I believe the 80, when they said 86.5% 86 has heard of the district, I, I was very pleased when I saw that number. I, I believe that's a reflection of, uh, of, of staff and Tripepi Smith's efforts of, of public outreach. Uh, staff and Pepe, I think in my opinion, staff and, and, and our consultants did an outstanding job um, getting our message out there, um, to, talking about the programs and really, really um, uh, getting out there and, and letting people know about the district. So I, I attribute that to um, staff and, Pepe, and Tri Pepe Smith is the 86.5% is the, uh, that heard the district. It seemed quite high. I don't remember it being nearly that high. No, it wasn't it's nearly that high. Not, not at all. And that's why you're right. And that, and the 2019 survey, that's why we brought in Tri Pepe Smith because there was a lack of knowledge about the district. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I don't see any other hands. So, all right. We will postpone uh, PAFR until March. 
And that brings us to closing items. Uh, do any committee members have any closing comments? No? Um, I just wanted to thank staff. I, um, I saw it, I believe, in the newsletter, also on Instagram. I got an email alerting to everyone as much as possible about the delays with trash service pickup. Um, that obviously isn't ideal, but it was so nice to get the heads up in advance. I really appreciated that. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, uh, Sue, <laughs> hi, Vice Chair. Did she disappear? Uh, no, she's on mute. You got, you're on mute. Oh, unmute, unmute. There, there, you, there are. you are. Hi. <laughs> um, I have a question about CRNR's contract, and you may not be able to answer this right now. But I know the last time um, their contract was renewed, they were given the option to ask for a CPI increase every two years. That's optional, whether the board. Is that taken into consideration dollar wise in the overall bid or will it going forward? Because they win the bid because it's the lowest. But then if they get the CPI increase that they ask for every two years over the life of that contract, are they then still the lowest? And if not, is that kind of an end around on their contract? Like is, cause I know it's never been this way before. So I've been thinking about that and wanted to ask that question. And like I said, you may not be able to answer it right now, but I'm curious about that. So I'm trying to follow, I'm trying to follow what your, your the information you're, you're, you're seeking is so if if we approved their their CPI increase, then obviously their cost goes up. So therefore, would they still be one of the lowest um, cost or lowest rates in, in in the county, right? Is that what you're you're looking at? Well, well, yeah. It's like if if they are given the uh let's just say six percent, if they're given a six percent CPI increase. Mm -hmm. every two years if they ask for it mm -hmm. is do do we then add all those cpi increase over the 10 years and add it to what the cost of the contract would be to look at it to see are they still the lowest or are they essentially no longer the lowest because we're opening the door and giving them an e an increase that contractually the the district is not obligated to get well, I can tell you one thing, when they ask for um, a, a, a CPI increase, finance will, will look what kind of financial impact that would have on the solid waste fund. And that, that the one they were requesting, 5.8%, would have had an impact on our, our budget where we couldn't afford it. And we would have to do a, a rate increase. We'd have to do a Prop 218 hearing on that. And that costs more money. And that was one another, another significant reason why we, we were denying it, not only because of the, yes, their customer service was poor, but because of, um, we just couldn't afford it. So uh, yes, sir, the, our costs would go up um, if we approve it and, and that cost would, would continue to go up over the years of the contract. Um, um, but we will advise the board of this that we can't afford it and it's up to the board to make that decision okay well then we go do a rate adjustment um that's that's where we're at right now i mean um the good thing we did in this contract some 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 organizations have automatic cpis for their haulers they just automatically adjust there's there's no, nothing the, the residents nothing the, the the council nothing it can do and and i i i remember that when working with other, other organizations i said there's no way we're going to have our hands tied behind our backs and that's why i made sure that if they're going to recommend a cpi it has to go to the board for approval there's no automatic cpi so that was kind of our protection and it, and, and, and it helped so you, as you saw they denied it there was no automatic increase yeah, um, Scott, let me let me add to that. Um, Vice Chair Lester, um, when I've managed large contracts like that, that that can be increased uh, by the cost of living, let's call it, they're typically put against some type of a standard. And in this case, I believe the standard is um, CPIU for the Los Angeles area. And so if it was available, for that vendor, it's probably available for the other vendors, and they're all going to ask for that CPIU for the Los Angeles area, given the the cost of gasoline and and various things. 
in that Los Angeles, Southern California area over the last 12 month period, they, they basically publish a number that then all these vendors will then hang their hat on. So my, my guess and my experience uh, is all the vendors are gonna ask for whatever the CPIU for the Los Angeles area is. And, and um, Scott and uh, the district is very wise in having that be reviewed rather just an automatic thing. And in this case, it worked out for us. Thank you for clarifying that, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Rosemary, I see you've had your hand up. Well, not only is CPI asked for by a variety of different haulers, um, but there's a hundred ways that they can uh, sort of hide costs in a contract. And so to see whether we're um, holding the line, I mean, it takes a lot of work. I mean, and an obvious one, this just brings it full circle. I mean, if they're not picking up the trash, regularly for some places they're saving money by not sending a truck out and and i get we're in covid they have their short drivers but they could get the drivers that they do have and pay them overtime and provide the service that they've contractually agreed to but to save money they're like well we'll just get it another day or next week or whatever it is so there's there's a million ways for them to um pad their numbers and i and i um it's not just the cpi is what i'm adding i guess that's it thank you thank you for clarifying i mean scott with the negotiations the cac will have a chance to review it i assume before anything would move forward is that correct for the future negotiations yes we can we can bring we can bring um um back to the cac what what we agree to and hear your comments on it sure okay i realize we are in an advisory capacity uh but still I, I given there's so much interest i think that would be a good thing for us to discuss sure not a problem okay all right um i don't see any more hands is there uh, any board or staff comments no <laughs> okay uh thank you everyone for hanging in there uh I think we'll adjourn the meeting. Let's see, the next meeting is here, March 9th, Wednesday, March 9th, uh, hopefully hybrid, but I guess we're gonna wait and see how things go. Yeah, I think we'll wait, so we, we might be in person. We'll just, we'll have to wait and see. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, uh, thank you everyone. All right. Stay Thanks. safe, Good evening. happy new year. Bye -bye. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Bye -bye. all.